Welcome back to the studio. I have to make an admission. I just yesterday ordered my mom a couple Christmas gifts and a friend of mine a Christmas gift because I was thinking I still had about 10 days to go before Christmas. Christmas is this weekend. I, I don't know how it snuck up on me. Anyway, I've already made this version of the Merry Christmas wreath. Um, it's called Good Tidings, the actual applique pattern. And it comes in both the boutique and the uh, retro dots. dots. And I just want to show you that um, you can really change the look of it just by the way the kit that you buy, but also the material that you use. Um, so I'm going to be using this off-white, well it's white fabric, but it has that white printed ink on it. And these are notoriously hard to see until you write up on them. These white on white prints. But that's what I'm going to be using for the background. And so the leaves and the ribbons should show up really well. And I had chosen this a long time ago. And I will tell you, um, I thought long and hard about using this fabric for the background. It is a, a minty green and it has holly leaves on it and green berries and I certainly think it's light enough that the green leaves of the wreath would have shown up well on it but uh, it would have been a lower contrast and it would have been fine for me uh, but I don't know that it would have popped as much um, as some people would have liked I think it would have been okay but again, it would have been a lower contrast. So I don't know that it would have shown the applique to its uh, highest standard. So <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and use this as the outer border. And you can see that we've got the red dots, the red berries, and then the beautiful red ribbon. And I looked upstairs for quite a while looking for something uh, red with dots on it, the way that these had dots. I couldn't really put my hand on anything. So I just found some red solid fabric and I'm going to use that. I measured the width of one of the small dots. So a little more, it's a real, around three quarters of an inch. So I measured this inner border to finish around three quarters of an inch. Uh, even though there's no dots on there, I think it will be okay. So those are gonna be the fabrics that I use for this today. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and get my light box out. Uh, and get my pattern out and get that ironed. Um, I always dry iron my pattern to get any creases out because I don't want those creases to translate in a misplacement of any of my applique pieces. And after I get those done, I'll also pull my applique pieces out. There's gonna be a lot of very similar shapes in here. So I'm gonna separate those to make it a little easier during the uh, actual assembly process and then we'll go ahead and get going. And like I said, I know I have done one of these before, but I just want to show you what uh, a difference they can make with a different kit and with different fabrics that you use. The first thing that I always do is pull out my color cover sheet. I always like to keep this handy because so many of the pieces are the same shape in size but different colors and so the color cover sheet is a really great cheat to help you see which piece goes where now it doesn't really matter in the long run if you miss uh, place one or the other because it's all going to look great in the end but I like to get them in the right place because I'm supposed to get them in the right place so I like to keep this on hand also everything that you see here in the box or on site yeah inside this box is in the package and just as you see it here. So uh, that's just a good visual reference so you can see what is included. All of these pieces are laser cut and pre-fused with Steam Seam 2. So they're all ready to go. The whole process is peel, place, and press. So you just peel the paper backing off, you place it where it needs to go, and after you get all the pieces in place, then you can go ahead and press it with steam, and that's when it becomes permanent. On the back is also a set of instructions that walk you through step by step, tell you how the whole process works. 
The next thing I like to do, I pull out the pattern, and you can see the pattern was folded inside the kit because the pattern's larger than the package. So I always use my dry iron, and I like to iron the pattern just to get these creases out because I don't want these creases to translate into a misplacement of any of my pieces. Now I never have any water in my iron. I always use water in a spray bottle. So I don't have to worry about any sputtering on my paper pattern. Another thing I've gone ahead and done, I can tell you, is I have uh, stacked all of my applique pieces on top of each other in like shapes and colors. So all of my lettering is here, uh, my orange dots, all my red dots, all my spirals, and all the leaf sizes and colors are all on top of each other as they go. And that's just going to help me um, as I go through and assemble the applique uh, to get it to go nicely so I don't um, misplace or mis uh, lose one or get confused about something, which has happened and it could happen to anybody. I just want to make sure that I get my paper centered more or less. And I'm going to take a second to do this and then I'll turn the camera back on because I'm probably going to measure it. As you can see I have my paper centered and I have my lettering uh, out where just about where it's going to be going so I could make sure I had all my letters and they were uh, properly identified and now I'm going to go ahead and start putting the pieces down and I was having a uh, little trouble getting this back off so I'm just going to go ahead and score it I just scored the very back of the paper with uh, a little pen and that gave me something to hold on to Usually if you just bend the fabric, you can see that the paper backing just uh, peels away. Because the steam seam 2 is tacky on the back, you can see that it will stick to the background fabric without us having to fuse it and that will stay there long enough for us to position or reposition as we need to. We would be able to move this project around the room uh, if we were working on a table and then we needed to move to the ironing board. We'd be able to do that without losing any of our pieces. The other thing is that you can see the shiny substance on the back of the uh, fabric to let you know that the steam seam 2 is on the backing. Every once in a blue moon you might see that the steam seam 2 is still stuck to the paper and not the fabric. And all you have to do is reposition the paper backing, give this an iron or a press, let that cool down and go ahead and peel the paper off again. And you should see that uh, the steam seam 2 is now sticking to the fabric but I've only ever had to do that maybe twice in all the years I've been doing the applique. Very seldom ever happens. And during the summer months I noticed that the backing, the paper comes off much easier. Now that it's a little bit cooler it is sticking a little harder but that also could be a humidity issue. The studio is certainly a lot less humid in the winter. Doing these from the front is saving my back. When you're an old goat like I am, you have to worry about your back.
now that I have the top lettering, I'm going to go ahead and, oh, the bottom lettering, I'm going to go ahead and do the top. I feel like I'm all thumbs when I do this, of course. Some of these pieces are just a little too small for my caveman thumbs. These whole uh, series of applique projects go really quickly. And I don't think you need to have any kind of special skills to be able to do them. You're really just peeling some papers off the backing and placing pieces down. It's kind of like working with a puzzle and you're just placing the pieces where they go. If your kids have ever worked with a sticker book placing stickers in a book, then they certainly could uh, help you with this. If you wanted to just have them play, uh, they could keep the paper backing on it and put the pieces down just like a puzzle. If they're a little bit older, they could actually help you peel the paper backing off and put them down. What I'm going to do this time, I don't know if I've ever done this before or not, but I'm going to do all of the like pieces first. So I'm going to do all of my spirals and then I'll move on to a different size or shape leaf. I could certainly also do maybe the dots. What I like to do this way is continue to do the pieces so that the fewer pieces I have, the less options I have about where to put them and it just makes it a little easier to see where something goes. Every once in a while one of these will really s oh did I mess it up a lot? I messed it up enough. I've been trying to lose weight so my belly doesn't do that. Some of these shapes are so similar that I can really get messed up about where they go. In the beginning I don't think I knew that we had some of the pieces that were reverse image and that really through me for a loop. Anytime you see dotted lines uh, in conjunction with one of the pieces, that simply means that uh, that dotted portion of the applique goes underneath something else. I'm putting my little red dots down now since that's another obvious. And that's going to give me some color. The circles are one you do kind of want to be careful with because they're small and you don't want to fray the edges. If you want to, you could use the method of scoring the center circle and that would give you something to peel away from the back. But as I said, uh, almost any skill level could participate in helping with this project and that kind of gives people uh, an emotional connection to the project uh, for later when they might inherit the project or when it's gifted to them. Uh, the project would mean more because they actually help to create it. Gives you a more uh, a stronger connection a memory that every time they see it then they remember that time that they spent with you working on it.
which I kind of like that. I'm going to work now with the largest, uh, I don't know if I would call these a paisley or a leaf. I'm going to do all these largest ones. Some of these will have uh, two different directions, some curve to the left and some curve to the right. Uh, there's only one colorway on this largest shape, so you don't have to reference the color cover sheet for that. That's kind of a plus. There's a lot going on here. So you really have to pay attention to where the pieces start and stop, what is underneath, uh, what other pieces. But by doing these, I think one section, one piece at a time, I think it really helps to define uh, where things go and help you not be uh, confused about the different pieces. Hmm, so let's see what we could do next. I'm going to look at my color cover sheet. Maybe I'll do these dark green. I'll do those next since they always go above the largest leaf that we just finished. That will help guide my hand, knowing that there's a connection to the piece we just laid. I need uh, little uh, references, little landmarks, whether I'm driving or quilting. I always look for a specific fabric in a project that I need to line up time and time again. That's how I get something finished. I always look for the same piece over and over. I have a feeling I'm missing one somewhere. But this is a great idea. You just keep going like this and then at the end, I think it is there, but I think it's completely hidden. Let's see if it actually shows at all. I'm gonna keep this one off. I think it goes here but it's completely hidden. So I'm going to leave that one alone for a second. This is next. I'll go ahead and do these, a full circle of these. I can just see a, a circle of friends uh, getting together, uh, having a laugh. I know some people like to have a glass of wine and do painting. This is certainly a form of painting. It's almost like paint by numbers. And I think also, uh, even if you were drinking, I think this would be a, a, a very nice finished project. I don't think you could mess it up. Is that that one? Maybe that's where that one goes. Okay. That's what I mean, if you just keep going, eventually you find where things go just because everything else is in place. It's very user friendly. I know so many people want to get into a hobby, but they sometimes don't want to spend all the time that it takes to uh, learn all the skills. 
I see this over and over on Facebook where somebody will have just bought a long arm machine and they'll work on it one day and they're frustrated because their quilting doesn't look the same way as somebody who's been quilting for 30 years and they get really frustrated but the people who've been quilting for 30 years have been practicing for 30 years but something like this just about anybody could pick up and uh, do really well at and that's what this type of applique is geared towards you can see some of these curve to the left and some of them curve to the right and that is also a helpful key in determining where some of these pieces go There's another, another applique in this, I call them in this collection really. There was Evergreen and then there was Good Tidings. Evergreen uh, was a Christmas tree <clears throat> and they both essentially came out at the same time. And mm, I can't remember, I think it was Spring Market that they came out and we couldn't keep them in stock. They, they sold out so fast. Um, everyone loved them and they were our top seller for many, many years and they may still be the top seller uh, because they're just so, um, so typically Christmas. You know, you just, as soon as you see it, it just reads as Christmas, Christmas. So let's see. Okay, this is this one. So I know where that's going to go all the way around. I'm used to listening to music when I'm out here by myself and sometimes it seems so quiet it almost seems like my ears are ringing. But I made the mistake of having music playing once. I'll never do that again. I got so many unhappy messages after that. So now there's just music playing in my head. You'll see here that this probably will be completely covered by the ribbon when we get to it. Once I get all the uh, little uh, leaves down, I can go ahead and put the beautiful ribbon down. That's really the red and uh, red and a little bit of orange really is what makes the whole thing pop. It's that combination. You can see the pattern has shifted back and forth a couple times and some of my pieces may not be 1000% in exactly the right place but once that pattern pulls away from the back and no one can see where they go anymore it's not going to matter. Too often we uh, beat ourselves up about details that nobody's ever going to notice. This would be here. This is another one that's really going to be completely covered. I'm sure.
these last two are very small. I like doing these for a couple reasons. One is because it makes the studio look so beautiful. But it also gives me uh, material to quilt on. And I obviously need that in the studio. Sometimes it's kind of hard to keep up with the uh, balancing act of needing tops to quilt and then needing to make tops and uh, illustrating different techniques both in the quilting, the piecing, and uh, the applique. You can see now how we're really getting down to very few pieces left and it makes it so much easier to tell where these pieces belong. Now I have uh, two leaves and the ribbon. I think the last time the ribbon kind of confounded me a little bit. One of the shapes. We'll see if it confounds me again. But that again is why I love that color cover sheet. Really comes in handy. Before you get to the finish it's always good to uh, take a really good look and make sure that everything is as you would have it. Sometimes for me, as I'm looking at it upside down, everything looks like it could be correct. But then uh, when I look at it from the right side, it doesn't look right. This is completely covered, so I'm taking it out. I don't want it to shadow the ribbon. And let's see, where's the... Managed to lose my other ribbons piece underneath the fabric. I've done that many times. Lost lost one of my pieces but I find it on the floor I find it on my belly I just want to make sure if you put one of these in the wrong place all you have to do is peel it up as long as you haven't fused it and that's why I wait until the very end to fuse anything just to make sure I have everything just perfect.
With the light box on, you can see there's quite a bit more shadowing, but once we get the light box off and the other fabrics underneath it for quilting, then we won't have that issue. And I have one last piece and that's gonna be my ribbon here. So after I get this last piece on, I will come around to the front and just take a really good look to make sure that everything is uh, where I think it should be, except for this one leaf. I'm not gonna use it. Uh, and then I will go ahead and get the iron ready. I'm gonna replace my light box with the Teflon pressing sheet and I'll get ready for fusing. Okay, I looked and I'm happy. So I took out my light box because I don't want to melt it with my iron and I pulled out my Teflon pressing sheet. A lot of the time I'll put the sheet on both underneath and on top, but this is a pretty big piece and my sheet's not big enough to sandwich it. So I'm just gonna lay it on top today. <clears throat> As I said earlier, I don't put water in my iron, but we do need moisture as a part of the steam seam process. Steamaseam 2 is a uh, fusible web that requires steam to uh, create that bonding. Uh, Steamaseam 2, much like concrete, requires moisture to activate the bonding agent. So I'm going to use a spray bottle to provide the moisture for the bonding process. That way the iron doesn't have to provide it. Uh, I don't keep water in my iron because uh, I eventually drop the iron or uh, knock it off of the ironing board and the seals will break and it will start leaking or it will just be a uh, bad iron and it will start leaking or uh, it will have a self-cleaning cycle and it will start sputtering on my fabric or it will get rust somewhere and it will leak on my quilt. So if I never put water in it, I never have any of these issues. And I don't have to buy a $300 iron. I can buy a less expensive iron and it will suit the purpose just fine. And then I can get a little spray bottle as well. The Teflon pressing sheet does a lot of things for me as well. It uh, is an insulator, so it protects the uh, project. Uh, this way I can't easily scorch the, any of the fabric, the applique or the background with the heat of the iron. So if you're kind of new to this process, the Teflon pressing sheet is kind of a little bit of an insurance policy. But we do have to allow the heat of the iron to transfer through the Teflon pressing sheet and through each of the layers of applique and fusible web and to the background. In some cases, like where the ribbon is, we have multiple layers of applique, fusible web, applique, fusible web, and background. So we really have to make sure that we're allowing that heat to transfer through all those layers. Another thing that the iron does with in conjunction with the Teflon pressing sheet is it protects the edges of the applique because I have a, a habit of just sliding the iron side to side and without the Teflon pressing sheet the sole plate edge would catch the edge of the applique and smash it up but it would be underneath the sole plate and I wouldn't see it and I would be fusing the applique all crinkled up which is not the look that I'm going for. So the Teflon pressing sheet preserves the edges of the applique and keeps them crisp. The Teflon pressing sheet also prevents any of the fusible web from the applique pieces from escaping the edge and getting on the sole plate. So it helps to keep my iron clean. It also keeps anything from my sole plate from transferring to the applique or the background. So it keeps my project clean in that regard also. This is uh, one of the tedious parts of doing fusible web, but this is where most people get it wrong. 
fusible web, steam and seam 2, cannot be evaporated away. You cannot overheat it and have it dissipate and disappear. It's not going to go anywhere. <clears throat> so usually if people make a mistake with it, it's either that they didn't use steam or that they didn't, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> that they didn't allow the iron to heat long enough to allow that bonding mechanism to work with the steam and the heat. If you're getting gumming on your needle, if you're doing uh, top stitching or quilting, that's an indication that you did not bond the long enough with the iron or that you did not use steam or that the temperature of your iron was not high enough to activate the moisture and create a bond. Once this is fused properly with both heat, time, and uh, moisture, this is permanent and doesn't require any stitching of any kind to make it stay on the fabric. Once it is fused properly at this point, requires no top stitching on the edges of the pieces, and it doesn't require any quilting. So if you were just going to make uh, a pillow or put it on the back of a jacket or on the bottom of your jeans, you don't have to do any stitching on top of it. You could put this on a piece of wood, uh, on glass, on canvas, burlap, a wide variety of items and it would uh, bond beautifully. If you can't use the heat of an iron, you could also use the heat of a blow dryer and use a tea towel to help press it in place while it cools. As you can see, I get fidgety and I move the iron around way too much. So I'm going to uh, iron this some more with the camera off, which is where I'll calm down a little bit. But also, once I finish ironing this from the top down, I'm going to flip the entire block over, respray it with my water, and then I'm going to iron it again the same amount of time from the back because I want to make absolutely sure that I've bonded all of these pieces, every layer, activating that fusible web with the moisture, the steam, and the the heat and the time required for it to bond permanently. <clears throat> okay, let's see what we have. <clears throat> so all in all, for a complete panel basically, the whole center of a quilt, this really doesn't take very long. And if you had a couple other helping hands, it wouldn't take even half that much time double the hands makes light work. So I'm going to go ahead and put the inner border and outer border on, but I have to kind of uncover my sewing table. Um, and I may even start that in the morning because it's getting dinner time. But um, I will go ahead and finish that, uh, finish the video up as soon as I get the uh, inner and outer border on because I do want you to see that. Um, and then we'll get to closing. So I'll do that next. So I got this wrapped up. I think if I had to had it to do over again, I might do the red inner border maybe a little bit even thinner than it is, but it does finish about the same size as the red berries. And also this outer border fabric may be an odd choice. Remember I said that I had originally wanted to use it as the background fabric and I think I would have been happy with it as a low contrast project, but I don't know that the mass, the masses would have been uh, thrilled with it because it wouldn't have made the applique pop as strong as this does. Uh, this crisp white is certainly a much louder um, punch than what the muted would be. And even as the border goes, uh, it's a soft border. Usually we do a much darker border than this, but I love the fabric so much, that very soft vintage uh, holly leaf with the berry. And this retro dots makes me think of the vintage feel anyway. So I'm really, really happy with the choice <sighs> emotionally, whether or not um, it works color-wise, 
value wise those aren't what I'm looking at it with I'm looking at it I think more with my heart and my memories than I am uh, with my color wheel but this is a finished project and I think what I wanted to show you was just how different I don't know if I can do this very well just how different the projects can look depending on which of the two kits that you get and the other choices that you make like the background fabric the inner border and outer border all play a big role so that's it for me today I need to get something to drink it's dry in here in the winter um, which is an odd thing the humidity is so low in here it makes it harder to peel the steam and steam too but I also heard you have to be careful with the machine because um, if a humidity drops like below 20% or something that your static electricity could damage the circuit board. I don't know if that's true or not. Anyway, I really appreciate you stopping in and visiting with us today. I know I'm probably not the most exciting person to listen to. I'm not one of those person that gives you an artificial excited voice. But I don't, my purpose isn't to be entertaining. My purpose is to be educational. So I try and speak clearly. I try and speak uh, fluidly and slow so that people can understand. But I don't try and speak bubbly and super exuberant uh, because that's not my personality and that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to be educational, not uh, super entertaining. Uh, in that way. So I thank you for uh, spending time with us today in the studio and we look forward to seeing you again next time. Until then, take care of yourself and take care of each other. I'm taking a nap.